to this session and we welcome all of you uh, to today's session on disinformation, free speech and democracy in a time of division. Um, we will, uh, I'll just do a little verbal quick uh, run through of our agenda today. Um, we're going to have uh, our presenters, Jillian and Todd, and I'll mention them a little bit more in a minute here, but we're going to talk about a sort of understanding the misinformation problem through examples. Those examples will be shared on the screen. They may be very small text. Uh, some of them as tweets and things like that, not to worry. We will share the recording and we'll share some of these slides with you afterwards. So if you want to read in more detail, you can do that. So do not worry about that, good folk. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about how we can combat misinformation as a society and as an individual. Uh, Jillian and Todd are going to take us through an exploration uh, of a misinformation journey uh, through a scenario uh, that you then will work on together in small groups. Uh, and then we'll bring you back together, have some presentation, some small group conversation time. We'll bring you back together to share some of the takeaways from the small groups. And we'll give you uh, instructions as we do that, as we go into each segment. Um, so with that, I'm so, so pleased to have our presenters today, uh, Jillian Youngblood. Jillian is the, here's Jillian. Uh, she's the executive director of Civic Genius. Uh, she has more than 15 years of experience in politics and government. Uh, she worked with Congressman Jerry Nadler. She worked uh, with, uh, in a, under the administration of Mayor Bloomberg in New York City. Um, she's done some communication work for an education technology startup. She has a focus on democracy reform, public health, and education policy. And I'm so pleased to call her friend. She is a respected leader within the democracy and bridge building uh, community. Um, and we just love her creative energy that she brings to all of us in this work. Um, so thank you, Jillian. And Todd um, Levinson. <laughs> uh, Todd has worked on uh, policy at the local, state, and national levels, international levels, it looks like, um, focusing on uh, how to help Americans get jobs jobs and gain the skills necessary to advance their careers. Uh, he's worked with the, uh, the New York City Mayor's Office, uh, with the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, he's worked with the United Nations and helped lead a conflict resolution effort uh, that guided civil society and government leaders from conflict to joint peace solutions, um, and has taught uh, moral and political psychology at the University of California in San Diego. So uh, I'm, I'm totally shorthanding all the great uh, depth that these two speakers have, but we welcome you and appreciate you being with us today. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Jillian and Todd. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, we're really happy to be here with you today. I um, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm going to do some probably clumsy screen sharing. So maybe Todd has prepared a musical number while I do that. Can't remember if we talked about that, Todd. Here we go. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's get started. So we wanted to start off with a few examples of misinformation. I should talk about Civic Genius. This is why you make notes. Civic Genius is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to overcoming political polarization. Yes. Your, uh, the notes are uh, showing. It's not just the, uh, the slides. Very cool. This is going great. Please Not hold. to worry, we are all uh, <laughs> Zoom um, appreciators, and many of us have been in the challenges of Zoom. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, give me one second. I apologize. Okay, tell me what happens. What are you seeing? We're seeing your name. We're seeing starting to share screen. Oh, did you see? We didn't see your presentation though. Didn't see my presentation. That is just give it a moment just to come flashback. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you would think I would be expert at this two <laughs> years so into Zoom. Right. Yes. There you go. Okay. And now are you seeing my notes? Yes, you just added them. This is totally confounding. All right. Well, we'll live. So I wanted to start off with 
A couple of examples of misinformation that can get us thinking about the different trade-offs as we decide what we want to do here. Um, this first one, this first one is something that perhaps you, like me, have seen on your neighborhood next door page, which is where I found this. So someone posted ready for emergency detentions and a link to the Washington state code being in the middle of a pandemic at the time, my, my mind jumped to assume that, you know, Washington state is looking to quarantine us in some way. And indeed, that is what this person uh, was implying. Um, he ended up spreading a rumor. And by the way, this was on, um, this was on yeah, there's 98 participants, but I'm here a variety of uh, national social media pages. This was all over the place. So it wasn't just this one guy, but in effect, he contributed to spreading this rumor that Washington state officials wanted to quarantine people um, who had tested positive for COVID-19. And as a result, thousands of people started emailing and calling the Board of Health, which is not particularly well-resourced um, because we've cut <laughs> public health the last couple of decades. Um, thousands of people were calling and emailing, overwhelming the Board of Health. Um, in fact, no one in state government um, was imposing or proposing mandatory quarantines. Um, even after clarification, people continued for days adding to the misinformation in the comments on this post until it was finally removed. Um, you can see in the previous slide, he said, I got a fact check from a local newspaper. Uh, so people have told me in the comments that this is incorrect, but he didn't really clarify and he didn't take it down. Um, in fact, the Board of Health was removing some outdated language from the 1980s regarding people with HIV and AIDS. It had nothing to do with COVID, but it completely blew up and it was in my local newspaper and on my local radio station. Here's another one. And if you can't read this, I'll just read them out loud. At close range, the concentration of airborne virus will be quite high. If you're close, you're much more likely to inhale the virus. You're also more likely to be sprayed by large droplets that land on your face, which doesn't happen if you're farther away. This comes from an expert who you've probably seen somewhere um, on TV or have heard on the radio named Dr. Lindsay Marr. She is one of a small handful of aerosol experts in the world. And she was one of the people who raised early alarms that COVID-19 could be spread through the air. This was at a time, so this would have been March of 2020, um, global health officials repeatedly insisted that the virus was not airborne and reiterated over and over, as did I following their lead, that masks were necessary only for healthcare workers. Um, and that was a reasonable thing to say. We did not have a lot of masks. We knew that healthcare workers critically needed them. At the same time, Dr. Marr was bringing up something that we, we later found out to be quite true, that we should all be wearing masks, that the virus could be spread um, in close quarters through the air. So some people have argued that public health officials um, in their attempts to uh, preserve masks for people who critically needed them, that they buried um, Dr. Marr's commentary and perhaps cost lives by delaying widespread mask mandates. Um, it's an example of everyone having a, I think a, a positive intention here, um, but it was difficult. Should Facebook or Twitter have taken down everything that Dr. Marr was saying? It was reasoned, it was based on science, but it was also, um, you know, it was in tension with what public health officials wanted at the time for good reason. Kind of the same thing going on with the lab leak theory. I read a new article every week that tells me one or the other um, of these things is true. So early on, there were rumors that the coronavirus had been released from a lab in China. Um, as you probably remember, we were seeing a spate of violence against Asian Americans in this country. We had good reason um, to avoid making any kind of, um, you know, jumping to any conclusions here that could have real world harms. Um, there's also an international security angle to this. We don't want to blame another country for unleashing something terrible upon the world um, if it's not true. At the same time, um, international security folks here said, well, it's plausible. We should probably look into it. And then indeed, we saw all kinds of articles like this. I read the lab leak theory of COVID's origin is not totally irrational. There was a moment when it seemed like actually people were coalescing around that being true. And then more recently, the New York Times put out what seemed to be a very authoritative um, report saying that there are two big new research reports and they both pointed to uh, a market as the origin of the pandemic. But same question here, should we 
in an attempt to kind of, you know, avoid spreading um, theories that are unfounded, should we use social media algorithms, for example, to push down things that we don't know yet if they're correct, like the lab leak theory? Um, or should we let that kind of information bubble up so that more people can investigate it, we can all think about it, um, and it can be in the public square as we figure out what to do next? I'm gonna to try to play this video very quickly. This is from TikTok. If your brain can handle TikTok. What is going on here? I will spare you the rest of this theatrical panting. So this is ostensibly a gentleman, oh boy, there we go. This is ostensibly, um, a gentleman who is live streaming from Ukraine. So you can hear that he's breathing heavily. There are sirens or air raid sirens in the background. He's running ostensibly through the streets of Kyiv. Um, he says he's fleeing danger somewhere on the comments here. Um, in fact, this is not a live stream. It's not live at all. This video is on loop, which eventually you can see down there in the bottom left corner, some people start to catch on to, um, but not until 60,000 people saw this video. Um, this video and many others like it um, are asking for donations for the people of Ukraine, um, saying that the funds will, you know, will go to people who are evacuating, people who are are not able to get out of Ukraine. Um, and of course, this is some random person on TikTok, probably not, you know, the International Rescue Committee or some organization you might really want to donate to. Um, so people are giving money. Here's another example. Um, this is from Abby Richards, who's a great um, TikTok researcher, which is a job apparently. Uh, she's great at it. So this is a, a video. I, I couldn't pull the video because it was eventually taken down, um, but you can see and hear an explosion out the window. You can then hear people screaming in terror. Um, and it turns out that we don't know where that video is from, but we do know that the audio is from a 2020 explosion that happened in Beirut. It has nothing to do with whatever video that actually is. Um, and same thing, this person is um, raising money for Ukraine. Um, if you thought that this only applied to COVID, you are in luck. Let's talk about voting. So how about this one? Please be sure to remind people that 2018 is the first year citizens can vote by text. On November 6th, simply text VOTE to 729-725. Then when your local polling station replies, proceed to vote on your local ballot. This doesn't really make grammatical or sense otherwise, which may be a tip off, um, but it comes from this social media post. They were replying to a bunch of reporters here. Ashley Parker is a reporter for the uh, Washington Post. Um, of course, you could not vote by text. You could not in 2018. Who knows what kind of impact this had, but it certainly contributed um, to spreading confusion about when and how people could vote. This one I think is hilarious. Attention hunters, if you vote in North Dakota, you may forfeit hunting licenses you have in other states. If you want to keep your out-of-state hunting licenses, you may not want to vote in North Dakota. This comes from a Facebook uh, post by a group calling itself North Dakota Democrats. Uh, Hunter alerts. <laughs> They had created this page. It incorrectly warned North Dakota, uh, North Dakotans, that they could lose their out-of-state hunting licenses if they voted in the midterm elections. Um, the Republican Party in North Dakota came out and decried this post, saying that it was trying to confuse voters. It certainly was. Martha pointed out to me the other day that this, um, we don't even really know who is behind this. So it says it's paid for by North Dakota Democrats. You know, is there another layer of disinformation behind this? Like, who created that? Is that the name of a real organization? Um, you really have to do a lot of fact checking in order to get to the bottom of some of these. Um, and then let's talk about the election that you guys are all probably tired of hearing about. Real Clear Politics has withdrawn its call for Biden in the, pre in the Pennsylvania election. So this comes from a YouTube host named Gary Franchi. He was one of many commentators spreading confusion about the election tally as it was going on. Um, you know, Pennsylvania certainly was a, was a swing state. That was a place where we wanted to uh, see definitive results one way or the other come in. Um, but this was one of the early parts of the effort to sow confusion, to say that the election results are fraudulent, they're incorrect, there is some kind of cover-up. This was the precursor to a lot of the Stop the Steal stuff. Um, and you certainly saw this narrative um, all over the place for many months. 
And I am going to see, okay. Sorry, everyone, my slides are a little bit all over the place. So as you can hear from that, disinformation is a topic. You can still see my notes, can't you? No, we can't, we can't oh, see anything. Can. There's no sharing right now. There's no sharing right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry about that, everybody. So no matter if you're on the left or the right, you have seen some examples of disinformation and we could spend all day talking about the impact of disinformation, whether it's on our electoral system, our social cohesion, our international security. So to tease that out, we're going to tell you a little story about a piece of disinformation. I promise it's fictional, um, although some elements might feel a little familiar. And um, then we're going to talk about some ways that that could have gone differently. Um, before we get into it, Todd is going to give us a framework for how we could approach the issue of misinformation and free speech so you can have that in your head as we go through our story. Cheryl, thank you very much for saving my slide that, line. That is me. Uh, is this, <laughs> can you all see this? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. We'll go on this. And you can just start the presentation there, Todd. Wonderful. Excellent. So we want to take you through a journey of how a piece of information goes from Todd, can you do? Sorry, Todd, can you do slideshow start just so it, it takes up the whole screen? Yeah, then I can't see, unfortunately. <laughs> We're in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the same boat. Okay. Can you all see this? Is this good enough? Yeah. Okay. Thank you can you. see. Okay, great. There. There you go. That's, that's even better. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great. Now it's just how I get to the next slide. Let me pull some of that back. Okay, great. I think that's perfect. Excellent. So we want to take you through a journey of how a piece of information goes from senders to receivers and, and see how we might use each step along that journey each possible point of intervention to disrupt in misinformation while still preserving free speech. Now, a piece of it, misinformation starts with some actor putting it out there to be received. That actor could be another nation, um, as we saw in, uh, as we kind of see in real time right now. It could be political leaders within the country. It could be media actors or just regular individuals. Um, and any of these actors might or might not have some kind of agenda in sharing that misinformation. With that information being shared, at the first stage where we moderate content, there is a decision about whether a piece of information is in or out. That's the first stage and the first choice we need to make. Can't, should we intervene there? Then for information that gets through the filter of moderation, we have a second stage that determines whether a piece of information gets more or less amplified. Like a dial we can turn that influences what information spreads to greater or fewer numbers of users. In these first two stages, we focus more on how to control the flow of information. In the next two stages, we focus more on how to empower individuals to influence the kind of information we receive and how we respond to that information. So at the third stage, we focus more on consumer choice. If consumers had more social media platform options to choose from, more quality content to access, and more control over their data, they might choose better products that give us more reliable and constructive information and minimize our piece of misinformation's ability to reach too many people. Finally, at the final stage, we care less about whether our piece of misinformation reaches an individual and more about what they do with that information. Here, we focus on improving people's ability to separate fact from fiction. Each of these stages is a possible point of intervention. We are now going to share a story of how information can spread and the impact it can have. And along the way, we'll dive deeper into each point of intervention. Later, you're going to all do an activity in groups of three where you'll share and discuss which points of intervention you most prefer for devising a solution to the problem of misinformation. Feel free to jot down notes on the worksheet that was sent out to a number of you um, or on some other you know, piece of, uh, you know, on other, some other document in preparation for the activity so that you're ready for it. With that, let's start our story. 
all right, here's the scene. Let me know if you want to buy the screen rights. It's ridiculous. The Democratic Republic of Freedom Land, ironically ruled by an iron-fisted autocrat, this being the League of Women Voters, it's naturally a woman. She looks nice, I don't know. Um, she starts telling journalists that the faraway nation of Tranquilia, that's where you live, is preparing to invade. Now, our government here in Tranquilia says that this is untrue and accuses Freedom Land of trying to sow unrest, confusion, and anger. Mainstream media outlets say they've looked into the claims. They are reporting that government sources say there's no evidence of any plan to attack Freedom Land. Next slide. Nonetheless, we start seeing a bunch of social media posts criticizing Tranquilia for its secret plans to attack Freedom Land. There are some interesting things about these posts. A lot of them are coming from new social media accounts. You can see that they were just opened in the past few weeks. Others are coming from accounts that have been around for a while and used to promote things like juice cleanses or credit repair services. But suddenly, here they are posting about international security. Next slide. A lot of these posts are identical, suggesting that they are not all by real people, they're more likely by bots. And these posts use splashy language intended to provoke an emotional response, which we know gets more engagement. And more engagement is good for social media companies because it means that more users are seeing ads and ad sales are how social media companies make money. Tranquilians, that's you for your part. You have no interest in attacking Freedom Land. Polls show that 92% of you cannot even find it on a map. So now the number of accounts The number of accounts posting about the secret invasion plan continues growing. The posts are getting picked up by social media accounts that are real, run by real people with authentic followers. There's another weird thing going on, which is that some people in Tranquilia are seeing a lot of these posts, and they have the impression that there is a potentially major conspiracy going on. Other people, however, aren't hearing much about this matter at all. Maybe they've heard a little bit about it, it's just kind of in the background, or they wouldn't know what you're talking about if you brought it up at a party. Now, a very popular cable host gets in the game and starts covering the story. He is both feeding off of and driving what's happening on social media. This is important because although we're talking about digital disinformation here, the digital space doesn't exist in a world on its own. There's interaction between online and offline speech and actions. So the issue is increasingly in the news. Many more people are beginning to have opinions about it. As you can see, these are all invented tweets that we have a lot of fun making. <laughs> At this point, next slide, mainstream media outlets start publishing explainers about the controversy, showing that there's really no evidence of a secret invasion plan. Other journalists and commentators say that cable host is just spouting nonsense for the ratings. Tell me if this is sounding familiar. Regardless, Freedom Land's disinformation campaign has officially gone mainstream. So with all this social media activity and news coverage, public opinion starts to shift. Now half of Tranquilians oppose the supposed invasion plans, and the other half think that we actually should invade, even though this whole thing is a foreign disinformation campaign. So when we think about real world impacts, here we are potentially moving into a war that would have catastrophic consequences, and the emperor has no clothes. So now... People are calling and writing and tweeting at their elected officials. Perhaps the League of Women Voters has a campaign around this and you're urging everyone to call Congress. So now members of Congress and other elected officials have to take to social media and TV and radio to make their stances known. They've now got to have an opinion on this. It's starting to get really confusing because we see this moving up the chain to more and more respected actors. Um, and it implies that something very serious is going on here. Regular people like us don't know what to believe. Sorry, I forgot I'm the autocrat. Regular people like you don't know what to believe. Looking for guideposts to help them understand what this whole thing is about, they start aligning strongly with their political parties. Now, in the beginning of this whole thing, social media companies, let's say, were taking down posts that contained misinformation. But now they face two problems. One is that the volume of posts is more than their moderators can handle. 
And two is that many users want to see the posts that contain misinformation. They don't necessarily view this as misinformation, but as part of what their political party cares about. Can we go back to um, the second protest slide? It might be forward. <laughs> there we go. Anti-invasion protests pop up around the country and so do counter protests. Things are getting ugly, violent. In fact, protesters are showing up to town halls and threatening members of Congress. Armed protesters are packing state capitals. Everyone is now talking about this. Podcasters, celebrities, popular social media accounts who never talk about this stuff. Millions of people start to think that the secret invasion plan by Tranquilia is a real problem. Millions of others worry that the secret invasion believers are going to start an actual war based on fiction. Trust is uh, between the two sides is starting to erode quickly. The issue takes over politics to the point where nothing else is really getting done. Um, Todd, this is the part of the story where it starts to feel like we no longer live in the same reality. Uh, even in this fictional scenario, I immediately feel like I just want to shut it down, start from scratch, reboot the internet. And then I ask myself, well, who do I want making the decisions here? Do I want a handful of big tech companies to decide what the truth is? Do I want the government regulating speech? Um, and I don't really have an answer for that. So maybe we can figure it out together here. Todd's gonna help me and all of us uh, figure out how to think about this. Great, so let's talk about that right balance, the need to find the right balance between moderation and free speech. On one hand, does strong moderation clamp down on free speech too much and shut down potentially valuable information? What perspectives and ideas will we, will we lose? And will, we, will those who are stifled simply respond with greater intensity? Will there be greater interest in this topic? And will people just adapt and find some other way to find the information? We talked, for instance, about two good examples earlier where there was reasoned good faith discussion online, the lab leak theory and when masks would be appropriate, right? The lab leak theory did not get the light of day and in fact was banned on Facebook at some point, right? But now we take it as a credible uh, possible option of what might have happened. The same with masks. While there were certainly concerns over masks, where masks would be used, the, those voices that said we needed masks um, were also not allowed to get the light of day in the way that looking back, we might have liked them too. And so there is this tension here about what do we allow and what don't we allow and how do we foster um, a space where different ideas have the light of day. Now, on the other hand, if we don't moderate early and instead allow misinformation to take root and spread, it becomes a lot harder for moderation to keep up, as we saw in our story, um, to just handle that volume of information. And some of that misinformation might lead to the kinds of harms and divisions we might be uh, concerned with, like in our story. So if we do think moderation is an important tool, there are three questions that we might want to answer. One, what should the standards be for what stays and what goes and who should decide? Two, what should accountability look like for violating those standards? Libraries are meant to be places of- and, should, and, and who should be held accountable? It's inconceivable. And then three- Any place of war. And then three, who should enforce that accountability and how? Let's look at these decisions and who might be involved. So here we have a chart that has the three decisions we just discussed on the top and different potential actors who might play a role in making and implementing those decisions. Government, tech companies and platforms, or other entities we might think of, academics, and citizens. So for coming up with standards, for example, should we trust government? tech companies, either individually or as a whole industry, or some other entity to decide what those standards are? And how should they make those decisions in a way that won't stifle constructive dissent and free expression? Again, in the mask and le lab leak examples, government and scientific authorities, people we generally would like to trust, were among those putting forth mistaken or narrow, at least, ideas. Even the most authoritative so sources on a subject can make mistake steps when the conversation is limited. But if we don't trust anyone to make those decisions, what 
other lever should we use to handle the challenge of misinformation? All right, let's say uh, we do have um, a plan for fairly and effectively coming up with standards. Who should accountability, what should accountability look like for violating those standards? Should anyone be held accountable for misinformation? And if so, who? The users who share that information, social media companies. So for example, if a user posts mis misinformation that leads to real world harm, should the social media platform be legally liable for what is on their platform? If a group spreads false online rumors, for instance, that anyone with a parole violation will be arrested at their polling site, which deters some people from voting, should the platform be liable because they didn't remove those posts? Lastly, if we want more accountability, who should enforce it and how? Jillian, what might enforcement look like, for instance, from the government? Yeah, I think the big thing to know here is that today, tech companies are immune from responsibility when users post problematic content on their platforms. That is due to a piece of law called Section 230 of the communication we Um, it was created in the 90s to enable tech companies to grow and flourish rather than bankrupting them with lawsuits um, where anyone could sue a company and say someone has posted something that is uh, defamatory or incorrect. Um, the, the idea was that tech companies would just be dead in the water. They'd never be able to make it because they'd be bogged down with these lawsuits. This was a bipartisan effort that was created by a Republican and a Democrat in the Senate. Um, and I'll note that this is different than other kinds of media. So news stations get fined by the FCC if someone drops an F-bomb on camera. Um, and people right now on both sides of the aisle have a lot to say about Section 230. Some will say it is critically important. We've got to keep it. Others say that we should amend it, um, that we should even abolish it um, so that social media companies have some legal liability for the content that's on their platforms. Great. And, you know, another possibility here is that maybe we just don't even want government to be involved. Maybe consumers themselves should be the ultimate enforcers, either through, you know, changing platforms, which we'll, be, we'll discuss later, or perhaps they can be part of actually reviewing decisions about content that's removed through moderation um, in some kind of appeals process. So there are different ways that different actors can be involved in moderation. If you want to just take a moment now just to dot, jot down some quick thoughts about whether this would or would not be a preferred point of intervention for you. And what approach you might look like, now would be a good time. What roles do you think these different entities should play, if any? We'll just give you a couple moments to jot down some thoughts so that you can take that into your discussion later. I'm seeing someone in the chat who correctly said, if you see a bot or a troll, do not argue or engage. Do not feed the trolls is a very good tip. <laughs> Should we moderate, and if so, how and who should make these decisions and enforce? Great. Now that we have moderation covered, let's talk about amplification. With amplification, we have a slightly different but similar question as moderation. It is not whether or not content can stay on a platform, but whether it is spread to more or fewer people. By making a choice of what does and does not get amplified, are we still running into the same free speech problems? To stay with our masking and lab leak examples, for instance, are we satisfied if they are allowed on the site but not spread with equal strength as other competing ideas? Are our free speech rights um, fulfilled if, if there's not an equal playing field for our ideas. On the other hand, if a critical part of the disinformation problem is its spread, then is amplification actually the right point of intervention to target? The problem, according to some critics, is that social media companies earn more profit by getting users more engaged on their sites. And so the algorithms they use to determine what information we see are designed to maximize our engagement, 
which can lead them to boost the kind of outrageous, inflammatory, or downright false post, uh, posts we might not want to see spread. Now, you might see a particular post because you follow an account that it follows, or maybe you already engage with posts on this topic, or on topics that make the algorithm believe you would like this topic, like our juice cleanse or credit repair service uh, uh, um, examples in our story. <coughs> These are the kinds of factors that algorithms might use to push you misinformation content. So we would need to change in some way how the algorithms work which might involve targeting changes in the algorithm directly, or might simply involve requiring that we make those algorithms transparent, allowing them to be evaluated and challenged. Now, what might this look like? <coughs> Here we have our chart again. To change what information spreads, we might change the content the algorithms are created to amplify. For instance, getting them to bury rather than elevate the kind of outrageous, inflammatory, or unsubstantiated content we are discussing. Or maybe rather than targeting certain kinds of content, we target the incentives that motivate the content. We spoke about how algorithms try to boost engagement. Maybe if the algorithm was focused on maximizing the diversity or the credibility of content, we would get more reliable and constructive content spreading. Or maybe we just require that social media platforms make these algorithms transparent and let the natural forces of debate, competition, and advocacy drive experimentation and change in the algorithms. In each of these cases, there is a question of the role that government, tech companies, or other entities should play. Jillian, what's an example that might illustrate this? Yeah, so one thing that comes to mind is you might remember in the early days of Facebook that you just had a timeline, I think it was called the timeline, and Twitter worked this way as well, where the order in which things were posted was the order in which you saw them. Um, there was no boosting of things that were really um, outrageous or perhaps really interesting. I mean, some of this content is, that you see go viral is good content, and it's, um, it's nice that maybe more people get to see it, um, so I won't uh, make a judgment call there, but um, there is a proposal in Congress that would essentially say the algorithms have to go. Um, you can't, we can't let the social media companies boost um, or bury content in the way that they currently can now. Great. So go ahead now and take a moment once again to jot down some thoughts that you have about whether this would or would not be a preferred point of intervention for you and what your approach might look like if it were. Again, what roles should these different entities play, if any? How would you approach amplification if you think that this is the right place to intervene to reduce the negative impact of misinformation while still maintaining free speech? Great. Now that we have covered amplification, let's move on to consumer choice. With moderation and amplification, we largely focused on how to get rid of or limit the spread of problematic content. But maybe consumers are just not given enough choices to allow more reliable and constructive solutions to rise to the top for handling digital disinformation. If we gave consumers more choices, would they actually make choices that reduce the problem of disinformation? Or do we need to place moderation and amplification controls to let our better angels prevail? This is one of the, the basic tensions here on whether we might want to rely on consumer choice as the right point of intervention. Now, if we think consumer choice would help, what might that look like? Maybe steps must be taken to create more competition in this space, meaning social platforms. Maybe we need regulation to demand that consumers have choices that the free market won't provide. Maybe giving consumers ownership over their data will give them the leverage necessary to demand better solutions. Here again, we have our handy chart to organize our thinking about this point of intervention. 
So first, maybe consumers need more choices of the platforms that they can use or even on the platforms that they use. So what could this look like? Maybe it means breaking up big platforms or maybe just leveling the playing field so that users can easily move their data and relationships to competitors who might provide a better solution um, that would minimize disinformation and its impact. Would that work? Would breaking up the big platforms maybe take away from what makes them useful to us um, and just give us worse products? Maybe instead, consumers just need more choice on the platforms that exist. One platform, for instance, that we spoke to gives users control over the kind, what the algorithm is designed to feed them, a kind of personalized algorithm. Or perhaps platforms could even become a marketplace for, uh, uh, marketplace for algorithms, just like there is a marketplace for apps on our phones. And the best algorithms will rise to the top and be used. So that's one option of where we can give choice. But another option might be, it's, it could be the case that there's just not enough quality content that has a fighting chance to compete. Much has been said about the decline of investigative reporting and local journalism. Perhaps supporting more of the good stuff, whether through funding or being elevated by the platforms, would blunt the negative impacts of the disinformation that exists. Finally, we have platforms, we have content more and more choices. Some say we need more choice and control over our data. Now we spoke earlier about the potential power of being able to move our data to new platforms to drive change. Um, by also maybe enabling us to keep our data private, we could blunt the impact of disinformation by making it so that algorithms can't use our data to target us with disinformation. So how can we be given more choice? Um, and who might be involved in making that happen? Jillian, can you give us an example or two to illustrate this? Yeah, you gave some great ones and I wanna be mindful of time. So I'll just give the first one that comes to mind, which is a proposal in Congress that talks about filter bubble transparency. And it would basically require uh, social media platforms to allow users to opt out of algorithm feeds. So it would be a government requirement that uh, consumers have that choice on a platform. Great. Okay, so go ahead and take a, a, a short moment, a quick moment now to jot down some thoughts on consumer choice and whether this would be your preferred point of intervention. And if so, how you would approach it? Um, and again, what roles should these different entities play if you think this is the right place to intervene? Excellent. Now, for our last one, maybe the solution is not as much in consumer choice as in consumer empowerment. Here we are focused on improving the individual's ability to navigate a more complex information world, relying instead on a bottom-up individual responsibility and education approach. Can we rely on individuals to mitigate the harms that disinformation can create if we empower them? This section highlights three avenues to empower individuals. One, it could be our ability to separate fact from fiction through such methods as the SIFT method. Stop, investigate, find better co uh, coverage and trace the claims to their original context. Um, or it could be news literacy education programs. Having technological tools can help that can help us separate fact from fiction could also be a way to arm uh, users, individuals. And finally, building awareness of the problem of disinformation and the strategies to combat it could also be a lever here. So if we consider, if we consider building individuals capacity to separate fact from fiction through something like news literacy training, should that be something funded by the government, provided by tech companies, or promoted and created through some other entity? On the tools side, what tools might enable individuals to bet, be better consumers of information? For instance, would it help to have credibility ratings for the sources of online information? Do we need tools that detect the signs of disinformation for us so that we don't have to rely on ourselves to do so and warn us about the potential of disinformation? If these kinds of tools would indeed empower individuals, again, do we want government or tech companies to incentivize the creation of them? 
much like we incentivize or even subsidize the creation of other interventions we need to improve society. Maybe we need to focus on building awareness. For instance, maybe of the SIFT method through initiatives like ad campaigns. These are three of the levers we might use to empower individuals. So go ahead and take a couple last moments to jot down any thoughts that you have about this point of intervention, whether this would be your preferred point of intervention and how you would approach it and who you would get involved. Great. Now, we showed you the journey of a piece of misinformation and talked about the levers you can use to make change at different points along that journey, as well as the tensions that need to be resolved in choosing our solutions. In a moment, we're going to do an activity where you share and discuss your most preferred approach for handling the problem while preserving free speech. But before that, we want to give you some tips for how to navigate the problem of disinformation in your organizational roles. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk really briefly, and I definitely want to make sure we have enough time for the group activity, but want to talk about how you can use this information as a league member or a leader. I know that many of you encounter misinformation in your work, whether it is moderating a candidate forum or out there knocking on doors. So it's good knowing that you will encounter this in the field to think about how you want to handle it. So the first thing that I would think about in preparation for one of those scenarios is what are your criteria? for intervening. So is, for example, if someone brings up the lag leak theory in a debate, is that different from bringing up maybe stop the steal in a debate? Um, is there a line there for you? Is there not a line there for you? Are those the same category of disinformation? Um, you know, something that basically something that could be true versus something that's definitely not true. How do you want to handle that? Um, and in doing that, you'll need to determine, you know, what you know, what we know, and what we don't know. Um, these are these are judgment calls. So I think it, it comes down to, to what you're comfortable with. Um, if you do need to address that kind of thing in the moment, the approach I would take is to broaden the perspective of the discussion without alienating the person who has raised the misinformation. So, you know, um, a phrase like some people would say, um, so if Todd has just said something ridiculous, I could say, um, don't worry, I'm still voting for you. Um, some people would say A, B, and C is true instead of X, Y, and Z, as you just said. And then I would just redirect the conversation. So acknowledge that it happened. Don't leave it hanging, but don't give it more airtime. You should just feel empowered to cut it off. Um, that's how I would handle it. If we have more time at the end, um, we could definitely talk more about some role play there. <laughs> yeah, great. So now we're going to uh, break into groups of three to get deeper into these questions. We've got about 20 minutes for you. Person can take about five minutes to talk or share or to discuss their ideas about where you think the right point of intervention is. Is it moderation, amplification, consumer choice, or individual empowerment and action? And what the right lever is. Is it the government? Uh, should this fall to individuals? And what should they each do? So what you're going to do is you're gonna share your preferred approach, your rationale for choosing that approach, and what do you think the biggest drawbacks or weaknesses are for your approach? So be self-critical here. How would just using in this approach, Mark, what might be the unintended consequences um, that you could imagine? Then discuss the strengths and weaknesses of that approach as a group. Once you've discussed each person's approach for five minutes, then take another five or so minutes to discuss and compare the pros and cons or the trade-offs of the different approaches that your group has found compelling. So once you do this, we'll give you, so we'll give you 20 minutes. Um, once you do this, you will come back and we'll take questions and, and thoughts and hear more about your experience. Great, thank you everybody. I will break you out into these small group rooms in, in just a second here. Um, again, uh, we'll invite you as you come out to share some of your thoughts uh, and um, Enjoy the conversation you will have with uh, with your colleagues in your room. Encourage you to please turn on your cameras as well. All right, we'll see you in about 20 minutes.
Right, you all. I'm going to resume recording as we come back together in the full group room here. Um, we're going to take uh, just a few minutes. Uh, would like to see if um, you just had, you want to share into the chat just briefly, um, uh, you know, what maybe a point or two that came up from your uh, small group conversations. Um, you know, what... Uh, what did you think? How how was the uh, uh, the engagement? Um, you know, maybe share a takeaway that you had from your small group in the chat, um, and then we'll we'll have a few minutes also for questions. We noticed there were uh, questions that were coming in before you went into breakouts, uh, so we want to take maybe about 10 minutes of time here to see, get a bit, get a little of your feedback. Uh, what was a, a couple of takeaways that you had from your small groups? Go ahead and just type those in chat uh, and then we'll see what other questions. And if uh, we wanna take maybe one or two of you who may wanna share verbally uh, your takeaway from this experience, if you'd go ahead and, you know, in the bottom where you can see reactions, Go ahead and raise your hand. I'll show you like my hand is raised and we'll call on just a couple folks. <clears throat> okay. Or we read out some of the good dialogue. Great. Eye-opening exercise. Wonderful. None of our chat group uses social media. Ah, yes. Very, uh, very important. Oops. Am I frozen? Oops. You're not frozen, Cheryl. Okay, good. My screen has you all frozen, so I'm glad you can see me and hear me. Uh, I might not be able to see who's share raising their hand. So thank you for going into the chat and uh, sharing your experience here. <clears throat> Let's see. Good. We need stronger effort to teach consumers. Yes, very good comment. Yeah, think about an agreement to teach or moderate. All right. Let's see. I am because I'm sorry, you guys, because my free my screen is frozen. I see hands are raised, but uh, let's see. I'm going to ask one of my colleagues, maybe Barb or Martha, uh, if you could go ahead and I see Diane, if you could unmute yourself. And um, thank you, Diane Proctor uh, yeah. from Concord, Massachusetts, although presently in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, I just, our group was, was really fun. It was wide ranging, but I guess the, the, the discouraging conclusion at which we arrived is that in the last six years, the foundation of truth, what is true, has been so eroded that, you know, how we deal with the bifurcations in our society that have resulted um, is, is really troubling and that, the, the, that any kind of common platform of agreement about what is true has in many ways um, evaporated. And, and therefore knowing how to attack this, uh, your, we loved your grid, we loved the conversation, but we remain uh, verklempt. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you, Diane. Thank you, thank you. Great feedback. Uh, challenging work indeed. Uh, I see uh, Steve Buckley, you have your hand. Go ahead. Welcome, Steve. Yes, thank you. Um, I was, uh, we were talking about in our group about school boards, which seems to be not limited to any part of the country, the idea that they seem to be run without sufficient uh, explanation of protocol and etiquette or rules of engagement mm -hmm. simply because they seem to be getting out of control and my suggestion was that perhaps the league because they do so well with candidate forums which i assume are run the same way all across the country um that maybe something similar maybe some guidance could come from the league to help school boards um across the country i know there's a national association yeah. that asked the department of justice for help right but maybe they could get some help from the league about a standard protocol so that when people go to meetings they'll know they'll have a chance to say something without being interrupted or great whatever sounds good thank you steve okay um and i see janice you have your hand hi hi well we had a very freewheeling conversation but one thing we did seem to agree on is that lies 
and lying should not be covered under free speech. Hmm. That's true. Well, it, uh, being mistaken yeah, it yeah. is one thing, yeah. but when you knowingly lie mm. for your own benefit, yeah. uh, that should be should not be protected by free speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Important point. I don't know if Todd or Jillian, you have thoughts about, you know, sort of where that, how one determines that line and who determines that line and, you know, depending on the context, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, this is, well, yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, the crux of it. So it's not illegal to say something wrong. It's, uh, so if I say something defamatory, um, if I say that Todd is a terrorist, Todd can sue. And I say that on, I don't know, Instagram. Um, you, you did call Todd me a liar. Sue. You did call me a liar. <laughs> I did call you story. a liar. <laughs> and and the this presentation. Is <laughs> this is and there were lots of spread of that misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a hundred people here. Um, so Todd can sue me for that. Um, but it's not, you know, the government cannot prosecute me for that. And this is like, this is at the root of it. Um, and people have been spreading misinformation for as long as we've been able to disseminate misinformation, right? Like you could stand in the town square and hand out whatever kind of pamphlet you want. Um, but of course the scale when we're dealing with social media is just radically different. Um, and the way that we've, we've thought about the legal structure around this is, um, you know, has nothing to do with how information has been disseminated in the past. I cut you off, Todd, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna, you know, um, I hate to answer a question with a question, um, but I'm going to, because that's, I feel like part of our role. I mean, there's gonna be a question obviously around intention, right? You, you, you um, distinguish between a lie and just being misinformed. It's really hard to get at intention. That's one. Two is, you know, are, is there a parameter of harm that we might want to think of? Is any lie, even if it is intentional, one that should be, um, you know, should should prompt accountability? Um, and so, if there, if there, if it shouldn't, and there is some sort of parameter of harm, how much harm does it? What kind of harm does this cause? Um, then we need to figure out how do we even make those decisions, right? Like, where do we draw the line? Um, so those are just a couple of kind of questions um, to think about when it comes to actually, um, you know, implementing something like that. And of course, there's just general ethical issues that people would debate about in terms of free expression. Right. And I'll just add to that, um, someone in, in my small group made the good point that um, speech like all other rights is not unlimited. So you can't incite violence, for example. People always yeah. use the, the example of you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Um, so there, you know, there is already a line and we may, yeah. as Todd said, think about where to move it. And one other thing, just another question to think about is unintended consequences. So pushing down lies, what does that do? How, how, do, how would people respond on the other end, the people who are the sources of these, you know, supposed lies? Does that actually get us to the ultimate destination that we want um, in terms of um, change of hearts, change of minds, um, lack of motivation around spreading lies or misinformation? Um, there are some that make the case that actually trying to tamp these things down um, increases the intensity and the motivation to spread it and increases the interest of others to want to know, oh, that's a lie. Let me, let me pay attention. So it can be an amplifier itself. Right. Um, so these are all questions um, that I think are just worth thinking about when it comes to, you know, um, holding lies accountable, people yeah. who tell lies accountable. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, it is definitely a place where, and I can see in some of the chat, like it, it raises sort of more questions for us to be sort of thoughtful about, you know, the magnitude of lie, the, the magnitude of the information, the intention, um, and, and, and some of it, as we think kind of about elections, especially in people's um, interest or concern in the integrity of the elections and uh, getting out to vote and does my vote count? I mean, these are places where the League of Women Voters especially has a strong voice of credibility at the community, state and national level to help share 
good information, you know, factual information with people, with candidates and directing them to the right voting, uh, the, the right place for their vote, the right time and days that they can vote and things like that. So I know some of the ways that we've talked in the past about this is some of the best defense is a good offense. You're out there very regularly with credible information. Uh, so people start building trust, especially around in yeah. the election process. And to um, question who, just to build on what you're saying, Cheryl, to, to, to think about who we would trust to do this decision making. I mean, if you imagine right now, some of the censorship that's happening in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. um, would we imagine clamping down on information in that way in our society? Um, and, and even still people find information about the invasion going on, right? And so would it even, would it even work to clamp down on it? Mm -hmm. Or would people find this information, especially since we're not presumably going to become, have controls at the level of what Russia is, is doing right now? Um, mm -hmm. So some thoughts, some things to think about. Very good. I see we have a, a couple of more minutes here and a lot of good stuff going on in the chat that I can see even if my, my screen is froze. Uh, I also do see uh, Kathy Poor, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, thanks. Just quickly, yeah. when you were talking about um, election security and, and reassuring people, um, I belong to the League of Women Voters in Macomb County, Michigan, and we are, currently um, working on videos, uh, interviewing clerks, local clerks, and having them tell their story about what they do, how they carry out election Great. law. And uh, it's almost ready for Great. publication. So we will share that with you when it's ready. But um, we hope that voters will hear for, directly from the people charged with carrying out those rules. Great. Thanks. That is just wonderful. That is just such a great offering. People getting to see a little bit inside what the process looks like well, it can uh, raise their confidence. And I did see Barb in the chat mentioned uh, Observer Corps, League Observer Corps reporting out what, what they see in government or connecting citizens to those uh, pieces uh, is great. So much good stuff in the chat, everybody. We'll try to pull it and share some, some with you because I know we only have a couple more minutes here. Uh, just see one more hope. Uh, I see your hand up and that, we'll take that one last comment question there. Oh, we really do need media literacy courses at every stage of education because by the time Junior's in high school, he's already had a social media profile for years. So we need it for the kids as they're getting into this and the adults who are, didn't grow up with this, so they're not inured to what happens with it. And then also making people familiar with tools like mediabiasfactcheck.com or other similar uh, media evaluation sites so they can curate their feeds and get better information that way so they're inoculated with good information. Great, yes, great. Thank you all. I know I'm sorry we are coming to the close. Uh, if there are other questions or things like that, go ahead, put them in the chat and we will uh, we will look to see if we can answer any more uh, after the event. We will be sending out a recording, but let me turn it back over to uh, Jillian and Todd to talk a little bit about a program that uh, you could use to bring some of this into your community. Yes, um, thank you, Cheryl. So if you do not feel like you solved this issue today in your small group, we have many more opportunities to keep talking about this and hopefully find some common ground, find some places where we can all agree that there are some good intervention points and talk about how at a community level, we could move some of those, um, some of those ideas forward as policies, um, whether they relate to school boards, as someone mentioned, whether there are things Congress we, uh, we want Congress to do, whether we think tech companies need to take more responsibility and we need to push them wherever you think those levers are. Um, we wanted to tell you briefly about a new program that we are launching in April um, in a couple of communities across the country. One of them could be yours and um, Todd's going to tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, so it relates actually a lot to some of the stuff that was said in the chats. One person said, uh, we really need a day um, to, to discuss this. Um, so It's Your America actually gives you a day, a day to discuss it. Um, there was also, you know, a comment about having more questions than answers, and we hope that with more time you could get toward answers. It's Your America um, is designed, what it does is to bring together people from across the political spectrum, from across different social divides, to come together to learn about, discuss, and then figure out how to tackle critical issues um, in our country. 
The first topic that we are actually rolling out over the course of the year is digital disinformation and free speech. Um, this is, um, there was, uh, you know, with regard to the school board um, comment, we do create a context to have healthy, constructive engagement um, so that people can work over the course of the day um, toward some set of consensus solution. And then we're very much about action. And so over the course of, of the day, people will come to groups, small groups will come to um, consensus. They will decide what next steps they want to take together um, as a group, as a community. Um, and we will be running this in six to eight locations across the country, as well as some online national events. Jillian, do you want to discuss kind of where we're going? Sure. So we are working with some partners on the ground in the places that you see listed here. Um, but you can see question marks at the end there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first two places that will be in April, April 2nd will be in Cleveland. And when I say Cleveland, I mean the greater um, metro area. And on April 30th will be in Orange County, California. Um, after that, we are looking to get some of these on the, on the calendar. So they're all still falling into place. But if there are league folks out there who are interested in working with us to bring this program to your community, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, I think whichever one lands first is where we'll go next. So on the next slide, we'll just give you our contact information. And I'm gonna put the registration links for any Cleveland or OC folks in the chat. Um, in case those look interesting. Yeah, so there's there's three ways to get involved. One is you can just join us where we are um, if you happen to be there. Two is um, if you would like to bring um, this event to your area, email me about it and we'll definitely put you on the list and have a discussion about it. And then of course, you could just generally uh, spread to your network this work that we're doing. Again, there'll be a lot, a, a lot that we do in communities because we wanna spur community connection consensus and action, um, but we will also be doing some national events. Um, and we hope you'll you'll get involved. Um, we think this work is really important um, to the point of how big this issue is, um, how hard it is. One of the solutions that we are hoping we are adding is actually bringing to people together to talk about issues so they can, can live in one reality together um, and then take action based on that. And there is a question that someone has. Do we want to take it? Uh, oh, yes. Nancy. Thanks. I see Nancy may have moved away from her computer. <laughs> so. she is. Okay. Nancy, did you I'm have a here. question? Oh, I just wanted to make sure that you would let uh, give us, allow us to get copies of the chat uh, that we, because there are lots of good uh, fight ideas in there. Yes. Thank we'll, you. We'll, you bet. I've been making a record of all the comments, and so I'll, I'll do some editing, and we'll get that out to you. Jillian, do you have the links? Did you put the links in the chat? I did. Yep, links okay. are in the chat um, okay. to register for Cleveland and Orange County. If you're interested um, in potentially talking about another market, um, email Todd, or you can also email me, and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. We'd love, uh, love to come to a theater near you. Great. All right, uh, Martha, let me turn it over just, just to close with Martha Cox. And then if, uh, I know I would be able to stay a little bit longer if people have, have some time. I do see we are uh, at, the, at the time and- Carol, thanks so much. And, yeah. and thanks especially to Todd and Jillian for just a terrific presentation. You've really enlightened us all and we appreciate this and the work that you're doing every single day to bring Americans together to help our democracy thrive. We are in your debt. Um, we'll be, uh, uh, we're also very grateful to all of the leaguers, all of you who have joined us today. Uh, we know your time is precious and the work you do every day inspires those of us on the planning team who continue to work for your benefit. Uh, as we usually do, we will send out a post-event uh, follow-up with all the links, the recording when it's available. Give us a couple of days. Um, and we'll send out as much information as we have available. If you'd like to sign up for Civic um, Genius 
or uh, sign up for our uh, network news e-blast. We'll put the links for you to do so in the follow-up. So this concludes our program. Thanks a million for joining us today.